Hello again! Zack Attack is here with my WWE review for the night, May the 1st, 2017, from Sacramento, California. We had the aftermath of a bank, which admittedly wasn't that bad of a pay per view. Yeah, it's all like shitty things, house holes, house holes, but it was still, it was better than anyone expected. We thought it was like a shitty pay per view with the lack of build. Just ask last week's small about it. Coming out of that, there's probably a uh, really decent war today. Uh, there was some lagginess, but there was some little bit of storyline development. Excuse me, storyline development. And one of the few walls with no woman reigns. We haven't seen reigns on war in a while. Of course, he and Storm had a big fight during the main event of Payback last night. Speaking of main events, uh, really good main event tonight on Monday Night Wall. Really good triple threat main event that was rumored and it happened. And saw a couple feuds continue and a new feud that been that's been hinted since the superstar shakeup finally start to develop. So now here we go. We had some very interesting and shocking moments during our pay-per-view this past Sunday. Two new champions were crowned. Jericho genuinely shocked the hell out of me and everybody because everyone knew Jericho was leaving and he took the U.S. Championship from Kevin Owens on Sunday. But also in a shocker, Alexa Bliss defeated Bailey in her hometown of San Jose to capture the World Women's Championship and become the first woman to capture both World and SmackDown Women's titles. And that deserves a celebration, bitches! Yes, with all the World Women rings at the wing, in the ring, with this little pedestal for Alexa, the Five Feet of Fury, the Rick and Ricks of SmackDown, now called the Goddess of War, made her way into the ring, and made her a celebratory victory. Salvating, salivating, in her mystique, in her glory, in her delivering another epic promo, thanking everybody. She thanks Sasha Banks for pitting her, she got into Nia Jax's face. She really thanked Nia, because Nia is kind of the thing, because she was the one that basically beat up Sasha, gave her that some more drop, enable Alexa to pick up the pieces, steal the victory in that fatal four-way to enable her, to give the opportunity to take on Bailey and win the title on Sunday. So in the midst of all this, we had scheduled a tag team match with Bliss and Nia taking on Bailey and Sasha Banks. So as Blitz was continuing a great promo, probably one of the only great women that had to deliver a great promo, making fun of all the women at ringside, including Mickey James for bringing her back to SmackDown and saying that your contemporaries, like Fabulous Moolah and Mae Young, are in a better place. But after Mickey James' real contemporaries are Trish Stratus and Lita, who are still with us. But then Bailey got a little nod, a little diss from Bliss saying that, oh, I didn't know your entire family was going to be there. I thought just your father would be there. But your mother, your cousins, your cousin, everyone was crying. But dry their tears. Yeah, we all want my to look up to. And Bailey just attacked Alexa. And the entire women's roster got involved. And I was watching this. And I was like, we had a scheduled tag match. How are we making it to an eight-woman tag? Bingo, bingo. That's exactly what happened. A scheduled two-on-two -two became... Four on four, with Alexa Bliss and Nia being joined by Emma and Alicia Fox. Take on Sasha Banks and Bailey now being joined by Mickey James and Dana Brooke. God, Dana Brooke's still not a good person. Uh, decent opener for show. Uh, Bliss got her shots in, especially getting an opportunity to take Bailey on a little bit. We did see a little bit in the match with Dana Brooke and Emma. They're teasing a few between them. But uh, I still liked them when they were heels together, especially NXT. And it was sad to see Emma go down with that injury, which ended up being really bad, especially with the way they tried to repackage her as Emmalina. Now that gimmick's being tossed over to Lana. Just watch her promos on SmackDown recently, and you'll see what I'm talking about. Basically, the Emmalina gimmick is being, like I said, swapped to Lana, bringing up her and Rusev. Could be a bad decision. In the long run. Well, we'll see what happens with Rusev. He's been coming back probably my money in the bank to get a title match. Anywho, 
We had Alicia Fox recently dumped by Nora Dog to come back in the women's division, focus on herself, now on her boyfriend. As Foxy comes with big moves, Banks had a little exchange with Foxy, and Bailey and Banks took each other to team up with each other to take on Foxy, take down or down. And I thought we'd see Sasha turn here tonight, but hey, they're still saving it. So then, uh, after Bliss and Banks got involved a little bit, I like to see him in a proper feud. Bailey got in with some House of Fire moves, some big X and big strikes on the Bliss. He's a really big stunner, and then all of a sudden, Jax would come in to pick up a penny predicament from Bailey. And then Banks and Jax would be on the outside, and then making, like, all the people started flying, like, making James started flying on the Jax. They had a fucking ammo out, started tossing each other around outside of the ring, leaving Bliss and Bailey in the ring, enabling Bliss to deliver a DDT to Bailey in the 1 2 3 victory for Bliss for her team. After a poke in the eye. Poke in the eye started it. So, uh, there you go with that scenario. G good opener. Good opener to, for this show. Fun little opener. But who is next for Bliss? Will we, we'll probably see the inevitable Bailey Bliss rematch. But after that, we could see Sasha Bliss unless they turn Sasha here at last. So, uh, see how this goes. Now, on to our next matchup. Enzo Amore against Carl Anderson's tag team partner, Luke Gallows. This is a fear that never ends. It will go on and on, my friend. Uh, we did see Enzo and Cass come out, and then the club attacked them from behind. And it came down to order. And after that, after that beat down before... The match started, I don't really remember, because I kind of uh, did like probably everyone's doing in this feud right now. Changing the channel, or in my case, falling asleep. I legitimately fell asleep during this match, because this feud's boring me, man. I love both these guys, but they wrestle each other so many times, and he swap victories like, girls swap makeup. It's like, come on. But I did wake up, and did see that Luke Gallows got the victory. Like, the club and Angela Gassman inconsistent with the victories. Like, they switch positions. One week, they look good. Next week, they look like jokes. You know, both these are floundering. One of them, or at least both of them, would have been great for the SmackDown trade. You know, doing a superstar shake-up. One of these two teams should have been on SmackDown. And club had a win-win because each brand has a club member. AJ and, of course, Balor. So, like I said, this feud needs to end. Club needs to fear somebody else. It looked like fucking Giants again. We're a tag team, tag, tag team division in stagnant, especially with the Revival out, sadly, for a while, due to an ill time injury to Dash Wilder. They're picking up the pieces here, but uh, there you go. Club wins, but doesn't win by much because they're not getting enough heat. So you look like fucking badasses again. They're ruining them. So I hope everybody else did like I did fall asleep or change the channel. So, by the time I woke up from the Enzo Gallows match, we had Seth Rollins coming out, talking about his victory over Samoa Joe this past Sunday at Payback. Although, camera shows, Joe's arm was up. So, it could continue their feud. And we would see what it continue later on. So, he got his hands on Samoa Joe, beat him up, and then we saw Ben Balor come out. Talk about the fact that, uh, Want a piece of Brock Lesnar for the Universal title, but I think Braun's gonna get the shot at Great Balls of Fire. Groan. Then Dean Ambrose came out, the IC champion. Talking about wanting to fight anybody that he wants, and then Miz comes out. Now, Miz and Ambrose had a little thing going on, yes. I've been saying it, broken back in the last couple of weeks, we had these superstars shake up, and we still have a lot of old feuds. Especially with the club and Enzo, as I just mentioned, and Cass, and seeing a SmackDown feud being imported to all. Miz and Impulse. But they didn't have to see Miz and Balor last night. I was like, is Miz going to feud with Balor or is going to feud with Ambrose? Well, tonight, 
good angle via a phone call to from Dean Ambrose. Got a mid set between Finn Balor, The Miz, and Sam Rollins. A triple threat match to determine Dean Ambrose is next number one contender for that title. I'll be in Extreme Rules because that's the next Raw pay per view. Oh, maybe for Raw next week. Or we got, or whatever. So, uh, and then a little bit later on, Dean Ambrose did his like interviews with both Balor and uh, Wallace. That was kind of, kind of funny, especially during the Wallace line. You know, Ambrose was talking about how they know each other, and then at the end, it's like, back to you, Gorilla! And I love my good Cole's response. Thank you, Sean Moody! Old school references. And it'll make more sense when they're releasing this unreleased from, like, the early 90s. Like, late 80s, early 90s, unreleased DVD. They shot it with Charlie Caruso, who is pretty cute, but there's no Renee Young. And Sean Moody, back in the fold for this video, so... So we have that big main event set of triple threat match. Now on to the first of all two cruiserweight matches, six man action. We have Noam Dar teaming up with Tony Nese and the Brian Kendrick that took on Red Swan, Jack Gallagher, and Akira Dalzawa. This was a pretty uh, decent cruiserweight match. Uh, there were some decent spots in there, people were flying. Although, the bad thing is, Gallagher gave his tag team partners an umbrella. None of them used them! That would have been amazing to see all three guys use William the Third, Fourth, and Fifth to fly with the Mary Poppins thing. They really didn't do that. But there was a nasty spot. Tony Nese did a vertical suplex. And then he uh, nailed. It was it, it was to Zawa. And he had him up, and then he... Finishing up by slamming him into the top. Well, that was a cool little variation of suplex slam there. That was a cool spot from me. the superior athlete, as he called himself. And then like, everybody got some shots in. Especially isolated. Tozawa. Tozawa and Kendrick didn't get much interaction during this match. But he was being isolated by the heels. By Nice And by Noam Dog. Free from Alicia Fox. Like Foxy, I hope Dog can focus on himself. And get back up the ladder in the cruiserweight division. With no girl to hold him down. And he can get over with his talent. Not by the way that he says Alicia Fox's name. So then after the isolation of Tozawa. Which one came in and got out of the fire in the last three minutes. Was very fast paced action. That should have been the whole entire match for the Cruiserweight division. So came with some big kicks. Some big rolling thunder splats. To Kendrick. And then Gallagher gave it a big nasty headbutt to Kendrick and Ambrose started coming in. Tozawa and which one did a double fly spot, although Kendrick got at a wrong angle. He got Tozawa, but he had a bad angle. He couldn't capture which one splash until the replay angle showed a better one. And then Tozawa had a shining wizard after Kendrick had a Captain Sook on Gallagher. And that's when after that Tozawa and Swan would fly, leaning Kendrick in the ring with Jack Allen following the headbutt and he coming out of the captain's hook. Big drop kick in the corner from Gallagher to Kendrick in the 1-2-3 victory for the good guy team of Tozawa, Swan, and Gallagher. Uh, very long cruiserweight match. It got at least one commercial break. It was like at least a 10 minute match. So, great action. Still need some more development for these guys because you need a lot of baby faces. Challenge Neville. Still sick with A dub for now. But I love Gallagher, love Swanee, and Tozawa and Kendrick's feud needs to at least come to a proper end. You know, it's losing a lot of heat. You know, the multiple lessons it got it was good after a while. It got stale after a while though. You know, it started off good and it made a little stale. Our next segment involving Cesaro and Sheamus. Tony Heel. That's a great thing. With as I mentioned earlier, the tactics which is kinda stale right now. Especially now with the Revival probably erasing anyone's plans for him with the ill-time injury to Dash Wilder. And at the right time, Zoro and Sheamus was teasing a little bit of tension, a little bit of frustration. They turned heel last night, attacking the Hardys after the match, especially after knocking out Jeff's tooth. I didn't see it until the angle they showed on tonight's show. So the show, Shay Zoro, as they like to call themselves, came out in these matching taxi diver jackets. Especially... Sheamus walked in more with the Mohawk, you know, going for the Robert De Niro look. 
and they explain their reasons. I kind of explained in my payback review, watching their pre-show interview, they said that we like nostalgia is great, but it's all about the present. And that's kind of why they did what they did in the Hardys. Basically, they said that in the promo, saying that the Hardys came back, you ate it up. It was supposed to be our moment to regain the WWE World Tag Team titles. But no, the Hardys show up and stole our moment and everyone cheered them. You believed in us, and now you don't anymore. We fell by the wayside. We don't need you anymore, basically. And it's all about the present and the future, not the past. Which is kind of true. You know, I like these ball terrors coming back, especially like the Hardys. You know what? Like, come on. Who did not mark out during the Hardys coming back? They're calling it like a gimmick act, a nostalgia act. But not anymore, especially with the broken gimmick, which might be making its WWE alive hole. Sooner than later, especially after we see the Hardys come out, deliver a little bit of a promo, saying that we got, we heard your response, now here comes our response. And they did the lead, and they've been doing, like I said in my payback review, man's been doing this, but not saying the lead, but the first time on Wong, you hear him saying the lead, after doing that, and he and Jeff went to the ring, but Sheamus and all ran off, like skull and dogs. But both teams wanting a piece of each other. Sheamus is all do probably get an automatic rematch, but it's null and void. As they have to fight for a future shot. As Kurt Angle doing a backstage segment involving him and Golden Truth, who did have a conversation with the Hardys last night, won the challenge. The winner of last night's match, that was a conversation during the pre show. Angle said to Golden Truth, you have to fight for your victory, especially with your win loss record not being so good. So, we a match for next week, Tag Team Turmoil. So, we're guessing, I'm guessing the teams right now, in Tag Team Turmoil, will be Golden Truth, Shane's all, so James is all, Enzo and Cass, The Club. Those four teams. And maybe Lionel and Slater. And speaking of Lionel and Slater, First time seeing Slater on Raw in the ring. You see the backstage segments between Slater and a one-on-one -on -one match against Apollo Crews, who's now being aligned with the Titus brand, Titus O'Neil. This might be one of Titus's best investments, because as we all know, the Titus brand is really gone down in marketability and credibility, as his previous investments has not worked out well for him in the past. But He's kind of getting uh, Apollo Crews an opportunity to join him. And I think it could be a great thing for Apollo. You know, he needs something. He's been floundering for a while on the main roster. He got traded over from SmackDown to Raw with no momentum at all. After floundering towards the lower mid card of SmackDown. And hopefully now with a lot of momentum on his side. But his match was decent. But apparently, people travel for pay-per-views, as I mentioned. Probably didn't mention, but people do travel for events. And a lot of people did travel for payback. Probably some European fans. The same European fans that come to the war after WrestleMania. Apparently those people that usually go to war after Mania stayed in California an extra day. Because you know why? We saw a fucking beach ball come out during this match. God damn it. Thanks for not doing it during the Cruiserweight matches though, so... A plus for that, but damn, I know this feud's not going nowhere, but dang it. You know, you really need to heat up Apollo and Titus and make people invested and not bring out the fucking beach ball. Because you got know, cheers and then booze when the security took it away. And that's basically the crowd we had to this match in a nutshell. Basically, indifference and ignorance, just like the House of Horrors match. Any crack. Slater and uh, Apollo had some chain wrestling early on with some headlock, headlock city. And then Cruz would come with some big drop kicks, flag him on the outside. Wino and Titus would get a little bit fasty. And then the Slater missed a drop kick, Apollo near this atomic power bomb for the victory. One, two, three, Apollo wins. He's been winning since kind of reluctantly, should I say. You need to mention that part. Reluctantly teaming up with Titus O'Neill. He'll probably change his mood. He'll probably turn here, which would be a good thing for him. 
You know, you need something. I said last week that that something wasn't Titus. He shouldn't need Titus to get him over. But hey, one week later, it's like if Jinder Mahal, a jobber to the stars, can go from jobber one week to being a legitimate number one contender for the WWE Championship, especially with his alliance with the Sing Boys, then we can see Apollo Crews get over with Titus O'Neil. You know, they've been floundering and they can get over like Jinder Mahal has on SmackDown. So, uh, see how this goes. It's got potential. Such as a feud between Balor and Finn has potential. It's been teased for a while. Uh, you know, backstage, it would make a lot of sense. But hopefully it doesn't get too hokey like the Orton Wyatt feud. Which would lead to the next segment with Kurt Angle addressing the Braun Strowman Woman Reigns match at Payback. Both guys suffering damages. Obviously, Wayne suffered the most. Getting basically beat the shit out of during the match, and of course, after the match, with the steel steps being slammed chest first into it, before Strowman would nail the steps onto Woman's chest with a turn of bleeding. Fake blood and iron is still a great spot. But then during Wall Talk, the beginning of Wall Talk, Roman was being worn out to the uh, ambulance. And Roman was going to get attacked again from Strowman, but then Strowman hit the door of the ambulance as Roman walked out of the way and fell into a bunch of boxes. Apparently, not only has Roman suffered an injury, so then Braun Strowman with a separated rotator cuff. If it's real injury or not, the Bobby just taking this opportunity to take both guys off of television to a proper rematch, which will probably be Extreme Wolf. That's what we need. I've been saying it. We need a stipulation match. You know, we didn't get a stipulation at the back. But now I know why. They're going to save the big blow-off match for Extreme Wars. Basically, both guys are one and one. They had three matches. One that woman won. Then one that was like a no contest. And then, of course, Strowman won last night. So we had like the woman match. And we probably need like an Extreme Wars match. Or at least an extreme stipulation match. That I thought should have been a payback, but it may be saved for Extreme Wars. And I hope it's either an Extreme Wars match or a stretcher match or an ambulance match that should have been a payback, but hey, now we know why they're holding it off for Extreme Wars. So as I was talking about that, Bray Wyatt interrupted him. Very interesting scenario. See Kurt Angle colliding with Bray Wyatt. Of course, not being properly introduced, Bray's like, hey, I'm. Bray Wyatt, hello. I erased Randy Orton. I ended my chapter. Probably everyone was cheering a collective yay. Because we're glad this feud's over. It's been a little hokey. It had potential. But then it became too kind of like weird like Hardys. And, you know, like if you don't like the Hardy stuff, you didn't like most of the Wyatt, Bray, Orton stuff. Like what happened at House of Horrors. Got a uh, mixed reaction. I, I like some of it. But if it was like more attitudinal era, like more vicious weapons and stuff, would have been more awesomer. But uh, there are some things I there was there are some moments I legitimately laughed at, like the babies hung up. I did legitimately laugh during that segment. Some of it was creepy, but some of it was hilarious. Unintentionally hilarity. So why it's like you either with me, Angle, or you're in my way. To take Raw to the next level. And he goes like, it's my show, Bray. But it's my world, said Bray. And of course we would see Bray try to show his aggression later on. Now on to our next matchup. Second crudely match of the evening. Ada Boston Aries taking on TJP. Basically they're shorting his name now. They're dropping his last name, just using his initials, TJP. And they did face off on 205 Live last week, so we had a rematch. And I am delighted that TJ Perkins did not get involved in the match last night with Aries and Neville. Like, it would have made sense to see Perkins come out, but we did still had a screwy ending with Neville pulling the referee and getting out of that last chance wing. This was a decent cruiserweight match. With Aries looking aggressive early, wanted to get a piece of Neville's bitch. But then TJP would turn around with some big moves, including, of course, attacking the knee of Austin Aries with some drop kicks 
and trying to check the deep off. Damage it more by putting him in a tree of one, one point and just kicking her out of it. But then DJ Baby come from come back with some big moves like the elbow. And continue to work the knee, but then Aries, despite being on one knee, then come back with some suicide dives. Big splash from the top. And a big drop kicks and in with a pendulum elbow. And try to set up the discus elbow, the fiscus elbow at one point. But then TGP would drop him out, kick him in the knee, setting up the uh, the detonation kick. I like this sequence to end this match here. TGP was going for that detonation kick, and Aries countered it so beautifully into the last chancery. Great counter turning into that submission, with TJP had no other choice but to tap out. So he lost Aries in a great ending. To a very decent Kuzme matchup. Aries may have won the battle, but Neville, along with his boy TJP, may have been winning the war. As TJP would attack Austin Aries' knee yet again at the end of the match and put him into the knee bar with him standing tall. We'll probably see uh, Aries and, L and Neville face off again for the title. I kind of addressed this during payback. What's next for these guys? Are they going to continue to feud, especially with a legit? We match claim for Aries with that finish that happened at Payback. And with no legitimate good baby face that is over with the fans. I kind of addressed that last night about Gallagher face. Navo many times and so did Swan. Mustafa Ali would be next in line if he was more over with the fans than a beach ball. Kind of like what happened to Apollo Crews and Slater tonight. So, uh, there you go. We can see a Navo Aries feud, like, there's been a lot of feuds that get stale quickly, a la Club and Enzo and Cass, but this feud's not getting stale. The match has been great. You know, they faced off twice at Mania and at, Ass and at Payback. You know, expect a stipulation match in Extreme Rules. You know, matches that need payoffs, that it really, like, Payback wasn't really shown. The Payback would be at Extreme Rules for some people. Especially if it's Waynes and Storman. It's what we're we aiming towards. But I can keep him off TV for a bit for that. But now on to our main event. A really good main event. Probably one of the best main events in recent world memory. That wasn't Big Show Storman. Triple threat match to determine the number one contender for the Intercontinental Championship. The Miz taking on both Finn Balor and Seth Rollins. Well, the first half was like Seth Rollins and Finn Balor because Miz refusing it in. He basically wanted these guys to beat the crap out of each other. For the first time, facing each other one on one since SummerSlam, since Balor got injured by Seth, they've been teaming up with each other, but not face each other since SummerSlam. So Miz was like trying to get in and trying to get a sneak attack in, trying to come in from behind. But then eventually he got chased into the ring and got into the action by Balor and Seth. There were some great spots, great action, probably one of my favorite spots. Maybe towards the match, you saw Balor and Seth. Like, Seth was going for some, and then Balor would counter him and something like a big, nasty collision. That was like a nasty spot. Taking Balor out for a bit. It was very fast paced. Very exciting. Marie's got a little bit involved as a shield from the Miz as he was going to get splashed upon by either Balor or Seth. But then he got nailed anyway eventually after Marie's got out of the way. Because I think Seth was the one that jumped on Miz after Marie's got out of the way. And this is the longest match that Balor's been in since his concussion a few weeks back. He's still been being used. At least they kept him on screen the whole time instead of keeping him off. You know, he was in that short squash with Kurt Hawkins two weeks ago. He was in a six-man tag last week, but minimum. So he's, I think he's better now from the... I think he's better now from concussion because he was in there a long time. You know... There was a big moves, including 1916 on Miz. Miz gave us a big moves, and then we had like maybe towards like the the the, the climax. Seth Rollins is flying around despite Miz talking the bad knee, including putting it into the figure four at one point. As we got towards the climax of the match, like trifecta, the crescendo. Seth was on a wall. Bow was out for a little bit after that collision, and it was like near fall of the near fall. Exciting action. And I was thinking back in my mind, I was like before the match, I was like. Are we going to see interference from people? This is a triple threat match. No DQ. Are we going to see Finn Balor get screwed on by Bray Wyatt? Because Bray Wyatt and Balor mentioned that feud's been rumored. And we're gonna, are we going to see some more Joe get involved? Screw Wallens over? I was like, getting towards the match. This match was so good with so many good spots. I was like, 
and Balor and or Finn woman rival Bray get involved in May spoil the match. Well, not just one scenario panned out. Both did! Both panned out! First, Rollins got some moves on Miz, including the Fox Splash on the Bow as well. But then... The Rollins was in the suicide dives. After the, he did one on the Miz, and he did on the other side of the Bowler. Then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, Samoa Joe came out and jumped out Rollins, screwing him out of the matchup, leaving Bowler and Miz. So, okay, Joe's Seth's feud continues, especially if Joe's arm was up, and the match of payback was good, but hopefully their next match won't be following a shitty match like the House of Horrors. They had a bad, bad timing for that match. Bad timing, because the crowd was indifferent to House of Horrors, and that sucked the air out of San Jose Arena, and probably in the in-home audience as well. So if Seth incapitated by, decapitated by Joe, Barely Miz would duke it out, for the last few seconds of the match. Balor came in with a sling blade, drop kick in the corner, set up the coup de gras, and then, Bray Wyatt shows up! Knocking Balor off the top, kneeling with his sister Abigail, disappearing, and with Balor rendered lifeless, Miz gets the victory with the help from Bray Wyatt and also from Samoa Joe, knocking out both his opponents. Storyline-wise, this makes sense. Like, we kind of saw it coming with Miz getting the win, because anybody else in Ambrose would not make sense, because they've been teasing the Miz-Ambrose feud for a while, but should have been a payback last night. Even Miz said it during the opening salvo, during the second hour wall that set up this main event match, saying that you're so... Indifferent as an IC champion, you weren't even wrestling on the card. I was doing Miz TV with Finn Balor. So that made me think, is Miz going to feud with Balor? But it was just for this match. So we kind of knew that Miz was going to get the win. Whether it's by interference or not. So this sets up and continues some feuds. It's going to be ending with a purpose. We saw Miz win the match and get some... IC title match against Ambrose, and we'll probably get the IC title back, because he's probably been one of the best IC champions in recent memory. He did bring levity to that bout. Hello, his feud against Ziggler was one of the best mid-card feuds of late last year in SmackDown. But it's also set up the Balor Brain feud that's been teased. You know, this, like this, ever since Brain came in from the Superstar Shake-Up and uh, Balor's return... You know what I mean? There's been rumors about these two colliding. It's like the demon against the Edo words, and the stuff could be more cronier and probably a whole lot better. Hopefully, they will learn from the mistakes they did during the old Riot feud and really take heed to those advice to make the Balor Finn feud with Bray a lot more exciting, a lot more creepy than hilariously and cheesy like the Wyatt Orton feud. And Balor's been kind of stagnant. He lost his momentum since he came back. You know, because he was like, just moping around, waiting for something to do. And now he's got something going on, finally. With Balor being screwed over by Bray Wyatt, teasing the feud, and starting the feud that's been rumored. And then we saw some more George and Seth Rollins during the match. And their feud's going to continue. You know what I mean? They had a decent match to pay back. But I think in Extreme Rules, they'll get a match. Like, all these matches should be Extreme Rules. Because that's the next wall pay view. They have like a whole month to build it. They don't have like two weeks to build it. Because I think if I'm not mistaken, I need to double check. I need to double check that the uh, Extreme Rules pay per view, I think it's June 25th. I need to double check that. It is. June 4th. June 4th, Extreme Rules. Then I know Money in the Bank Smackdown. It's next pay per view. I couldn't believe it's not multi branded. Stupid. It's not multi branded. There's just one branded pay per view. It's June 18th. It's Smackdown. So basically, like I said, there was a month in between Payback and Extreme Rules. So now, we're building it up, so I'm guessing we're going to get a uh, Roman Strowman match 
Miz and Ambrose will probably be Extreme Rules. Balor and Wyatt will be in Extreme Rules. And Joe and Seth let the build for Extreme Rules begin. So, uh, there you go. With my wall review. Decent wall. Quick fun main event. And a lot of feuds developing. See what happens next week with the triple, uh, with the tag team turmoil match. See how that goes. And how they're going to pick up the pieces without the, the revival being involved for a while. So that is it for my wall review for this evening. Thank you so much for watching. With that in mind, you've all been attacked by the review from Zach. Thank you so much. See you next time. Bye-bye.